Thank you very much, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's particularly nice to be in my hometown, just having to come from uptown New York and not get on planes, trains, or automobiles. Nice, easy ride from Mount Sinai. And uh, I guess I come to visit you every few years, and I appreciate the invitation, and Russ and I go back a long, long ways. And uh, sorry he couldn't be here today, because I'm going to talk on an area of interest to both of us, and hopefully to many of you, which is neuropathic pain. I'm going to take a rather broad view. I'm not going to speak about one <clears throat> specific disease, although as many of you know, HIV neuropathy is one of my primary areas of interest. I'll use HIV as something of a springboard, but much of what I'm going to say, if not all of it, is relevant to other painful neuropathies, diabetes, postherpetic neuralgia, and the like, because frankly, we extrapolate the information from one neuropathy to the other, even though we don't necessarily have the data uh, for all those neuropathies. Let's see what I'll use as a pointer. Okay, we have this, that's fine. Now, there are many different ways to divide up pain, and this is one of the classical ones. It's got some limitations, but for at least sake of beginning, we can talk about nociceptive pain, which is that due to neural excitation from tissue damaging stimuli, post-op pain, arthritis, and the like. We then have neuropathic pain. This is initiated or caused by a primary lesion of the nervous system. And here you see things like postherpetic neuralgia, distal polyneuropathy from diabetes, HIV, post-stroke pain, and others. Interestingly, you've got some disorders which can appear in both categories. We might call them mixed type. Low back pain is a perfect example. You've got neuro neuropathic low back pain, particularly with radiculopathy, and you've got mechanical, and you can call it many other things because we usually don't know what it is, but let's say axial mid midline low back pain may or may not be primarily neuropathic, maybe due to muscle, joint, tendon, and other pathology. Now, when we're talking about neuropathic pain, we're talking about a primary lesion of the nervous system, as I mentioned. A peripheral nerve lesion, such as, let's say, a traumatic lesion here, whether it be a knife or a gun injury or carpal tunnel syndrome or others, or a lesion of the CNS, such as spinal cord. There are numerous potential causes, and this is essentially saying in another way what I just mentioned. Disease, infection like HIV, metabolic abnormalities like diabetes, trauma, genetic causes of neuropathy, very common, often are overlooked because it does take some, often some uh, sophisticated testing to find them. Iatrogenic causes, surgery, radiation being common. Now, I'm sorry, this projected well on my computer, but somehow it projects black here, so you can't, or maybe you can just barely read it. But this is Gary Bennett's review, a survey, and you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt, but neuropathic pain in the United States. And he estimated about 4 million, give or take, cases. And the single most common, interestingly in green, is low back pain. Now, remember I mentioned a moment ago that low back can be a mixed syndrome. It's not always necessarily neuropathic, but he put it in that category. Then the next big chunk is diabetes and postherpetic neuralgia. And these are the two diseases, neuropathic diseases, that are studied the most because one can find the patients, they're out there, the natural history is somewhat well known, and thus you can recruit for interventional studies. As a neuromuscular person and an EMG specialist, I spend a lot of my time working on separating the anatomy and the physiology of peripheral neuropathy. And these are some of the common patterns that we see, and they must be differentiated because different patterns, different physiologies have different treatments. For example, we have distal polyneuropathy, such as we see in diabetes or HIV, a mononeuropathy, carpal tunnel, ulnar, 
sciatic, mononeuropathy multiplex, asymmetric neuropathies, such as you might see in vasculitis like lupus or in diabetes as well, a brachial plexopathy, and then an entire body affected such as inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathies like Guillain-Barre or CIDP. And again, often clinically, it's not so evident as to what pattern it is, but in the EMG lab, you can find often subclinical defects that lead you to the proper diagnosis. As I mentioned, diabetes and PHN are the two most commonly studied disorders for the reasons that I've already mentioned. Diabetes is expanding rapidly, and one just has to pick up the New York Times to see articles on this all the time. Here we see the prevalence of diabetes in the U.S. from 94, with darker boxes indicating higher prevalence, into 2004. And you can clearly see a dramatic increase in prevalence of diabetes. It's estimated in New York City that in the East Harlem community, by the year 2020, 50% of the community will have evidence of glucose intolerance, 50% by glucose tolerance testing, not all frank diabetics. Well, how common is neuropathy in diabetes? Here you have some data from the Mayo Clinic, and of course the Mayo can find every patient under every rock, and so it's usually a pretty good estimate. And this goes back to old data from 86, but they took patients, either type 1, type 2 diabetics, and they subjected them to clinical exams, to nerve conduction studies, quantitative sensory testing, and looked for clinical or subclinical abnormalities. And here you see 60% of all diabetics had either clinical or subclinical neuropathy. Most distal polyneuropathy, some focal like carpal tunnel, and the smallest percentage, but an important one, is autonomic neuropathy. Again, I'm sorry for the projection in black. What's very clear in the neuropathy field is that many, many patients are missed, and this is often underdiagnosed. Here is a survey in which they took a group of diabetics and surveyed them, and 85% of this very selected group had clinical symptoms consistent with neuropathy. When they surveyed the physicians of these same patients, only 50% were considered to have evidence of diabetic neuropathy. And so you see a big discrepancy between consistent symptoms and physician identification. Zoster is an increasingly common problem as the population ages. This is clearly an age-associated disease with numbers increasingly dramatically in latter decades with a very typical dermatomal rash. And postherpetic neuralgia, which is one of the dreaded consequences of, di uh, of uh, acute zoster, pain that, depending on the author, can be three, four, six months after the rash heals. One in five Americans will develop zoster at some point in their life. And if you reach the age of 80, 50% of individuals 80 and above will develop zoster. 20 to 30 percent of those with acute zoster develop postherpetic neuralgia, and the prevalence, as I mentioned, is age-related. Now let's talk a bit about HIV for a moment. For those of you who haven't followed this disease closely, there have been dramatic changes since the onset of the epidemic, or pandemic, in the early 1980s, and in fact, I saw these patients in the early 1980s as a resident at Cornell. Here is one of the breakthroughs in HIV care. Here we have deaths from HIV in this 1990s period. About 1995-96 is when combination antiretroviral therapy became available, particularly with the protease inhibitors. 
As these cocktails became more widely used, the death rate dramatically plummeted. And today, HIV is a chronic disease. People are living potentially normal lifespans with this disease with good therapy, but with complications. Now, based on these encouraging data in the mid-90s, there was dramatic optimism. And in fact, the media were predicting the end of this disease, that we licked it. Well, clearly, almost 30 years since the beginning, it's not licked. Now, if we fast forward to New York Magazine in November of 2009, there was an interesting article called Another Kind of AIDS Crisis. And here, they talked about individuals that were living longer but getting older faster, showing signs of dementia, bone weakness, usually seen in the elderly, and in some patients, nerve damage. And these are some pictures of patients who kindly allowed themselves to be photographed, and many of them came from my clinic. The reporter actually spent several days in the clinic, and in the article talked about the early days, the early bad days at Mount Sinai when people were dying so quickly and how that's changed. How about HIV and neuropathy? Well, if you look at clinical bedside examination, over two-thirds of patients with HIV have evidence of neuropathy. Not all symptomatic, but at least clinical evidence based on exam, ankle jerks, vibration, and so forth. Neuropathy is frequently misdiagnosed and undertreated. Now, when we had the days of D drugs, D4T, DDI, DDC, there was high rates of neuropathy because these are neurotoxic. These drugs are being used far less in the developed world, but still used in the developing world. Pain is the symptom that gets most of our attention. It clearly affects quality of life and adherence to drugs. And at least in the NIH group some years ago, neuropathy was the highest research priority. Assessment, this is something that all of you know as well as I do. There are numerous ways to gauge pain. Clinical trials often use things such as the 0 to 10 numeric pain intensity scale. That can be quantitated, statistically analyzed, but you see other scales available as well. And in clinicians' charts, unfortunately, one of the problems is often we don't see any quantitation. We see better, worse, no change, but that often isn't terribly helpful. One of the problems with all the pain scales is how we gauge and gather the data. So for example, we ask a patient in a clinical trial, tell me your average pain over the last 24 hours. Typical question, 0 to 10. Well, if you look at a patient's pain over 24 hours, you see fluctuations. Clearly, it's not a straight line. And how does a patient take this type of experience and collapse it into a single number? Well, it's a gestalt that patients give us. And there's some information to argue that that gestalt might be a reasonable measure. But you can see of the limitations. And many clinical trials have gone to electronic pain diaries where patients will enter their pain scales on a prompt and you can actually gather multiple pain points during the day. Well, in addition to the severity of pain, we have quality of pain. And here you see some cute pictures of sharp and stabbing, burning, electrical type pain. And there is some information, although not as good as one might like, to indicate that the quality of pain may have some relevance to response to particular treatments. And there are pain scales that will collect quality features, but that literature really does need to be expanded. One of the, I think, greatest misconceptions about neuropathy and treatment is that the treatments we give help all the symptoms or might help them, but that's not quite true. There are positive symptoms, and what I usually tell patients is this is what makes you say, ouch, it hurts. 
exaggerated sensory responses to stimuli such as contact sensitivity, spontaneous pain, burning shock-like. Our treatments mostly address these features. The negative symptoms, such as numbness, is bothersome, but it's not necessarily painful. And it's a difficult conversation at times with patients to have them differentiate the positive and negative symptoms. I certainly see many patients who come in predominantly with numbness, are getting high doses of analgesics in some vain hope that they're going to help the numbness. And although there is some controversy about this, in my opinion, we don't really have dramatic impact on these negative symptoms with treatment, unless we can regenerate nerve, which is a whole other discussion. When we have a patient with neuropathy, it's not just pain management. And unfortunately, I see far too many patients who are getting their pain treated without sufficient attention to discovering the underlying cause of the neuropathy. And there are numerous diagnostic studies, obviously blood studies. One of the most important is glucose intolerance. Not everybody who comes in with glucose intolerance is going to have a f fasting blood sugar that's elevated or an elevated hemoglobin A1C even, although there's better sensitivity. But the two-hour 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test is really the test of choice for picking up impaired glucose tolerance. And IGT, impaired glucose tolerance, is now recognized as an important cause of neuropathy that patients may present with. How to manage it, whether it be diet and exercise or pharmacologic agents, is somewhat controversial. But there are studies looking at that now. EMG, well, this is what I do, and labs that I direct can be helpful. Not every patient with a straightforward distal polyneuropathy needs EMG, sometimes done in research studies. But when you see these unusual patterns, multi, multifocal, predominantly motor, and so forth, there these tests are critically important. Determine the physiology of the lesion, the anatomy of the lesion, and then one can really get into diagnosis, a specific diagnosis. And if you can identify a specific diagnosis and treat that, that can go a long way to improving the neuropathy. And I'll show you in a moment skin biopsy and how that can be helpful in diagnosis. Now EMG is not the last word because there are limitations. For example, they are insensitive and acute injuries. A normal result does not exclude neuropathic pain because we're not really looking at small nerve fibers. EMG nerve conduction look at large nerve fibers, but many painful neuropathies or small fiber neuropathies are not diagnosable by EMG. So normal EMG, don't let that fool you. The skin biopsy has become increasingly used in practice, and it can be quite an interesting diagnostic technique. It's done very much like the dermatologist might do a punch skin biopsy. I have them done I had them done to myself as a control. It's no big deal. You can do them serially, perhaps in a clinical trial. And this is what the scar looks like, a little tiny pale spot. Most people don't notice it. What does the histology look like? Well, to orient you, here's the surface of the skin. Here's the epidermis and the dermis. And when you stain it with a panaxonal marker called PGP 9.5, you see these nicely stained nerve fibers coming up to the skin, and this is a normal density in the thigh. Here, in an HIV patient, when we look at the distal leg, you can see one loss of the epidermal nerve fibers. They're gone, and that's what's used as the primary quantitative measure. And you see these interesting axonal swellings, which are pre-degenerative changes. And this can be very sensitive for small fiber neuropathy. In one of the HIV studies Justin MacArthur and our groups have looked at, you find at the thigh in red or the distal leg in green, as the pain intensity increases, one sees a progressive reduction in epidermal nerve fiber density.
Now we could easily spend an entire lecture on this one subject, and that is pathophysiology. There is a tremendous amount of research that has been looking at these issues. We have any of these mechanisms that have been demonstrated often in animal models or even in cell culture. And I'm not going to go through them in detail. You know these, excitotoxicity, sodium channel, ectopic discharges, the phenomenon of central or peripheral sensitization or wind-up, involvement of the sympathetic nervous system, inflammatory approaches including cytokines like TNF-alpha. And when we have an individual patient, the problem is we can't really identify in vivo which of these mechanisms are operative in a given patient's pain syndrome. Thus, it's very difficult to target pathophysiologically, and the approach to painful neuropathy is often empirical for that reason. Neuropathic pain does not travel in isolation. There are many comorbidities that one needs to consider, including sleep, energy, cognition, depression, anxiety, and so forth. And these comorbidities are important. Sometimes we don't know what's the cart and what's the egg, particularly with depression and neuropathic pain. However, we do need to treat comorbidities. And fortunately, some of the agents we have kill two birds with one stone. And we can treat both the neuropathic pain and, for example, depression or anxiety with a single agent. Well, let me move now in the final part of the talk into treatment approaches. It's been well documented by numerous authors that pain is undertreated. And I certainly don't need to tell this audience that with your expertise in pain management. I've already told you that pain is underrecognized. It is also clearly undertreated. Here are surveys from a Danish survey of patients with spinal cord injuries, as well as a Boston pain clinic. And here we have patients in this study, that is the Danish study, that had neuropathic pain and were being treated with agents known to have efficacy in neuropathic pain. And in this case, only 7%. We then moved to the Boston Pain Clinic, and in here, they looked at patients receiving tricyclics for neuropathic pain, and they looked at the question of whether they were being prescribed adequate doses by the definitions they used, and that's somewhat controversial. But at least by their definition, only 12% were receiving adequate doses for their pain. Now, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the analgesic ladder. And this was developed by the, w, the World Health Organization, mostly initially related to cancer-related pain. And we have mild, moderate, severe, with recommendations of escalation of agents and potency. For example, in mild pain, a non-opioid, such as an NSAID or acetaminophen, aspirin, with an adjuvant, such as an anticonvulsant or antidepressant. Mo moderate pain moving into opioids, <clears throat> and then in the severe, moving into perhaps more potent opioids plus an adjuvant. Now, to what extent this is applicable or relevant to non-cancer pain is controversial. I find it to be a reasonable model. One can argue that the stepwise approach may not necessarily be the best one if you argue that bringing effective treatments in earlier, even at the initiation, might be more effective than waiting <coughs> till people fail other agents. Again, there are data <coughs> on undertreatment. Here we have Charles Cleland looking at a cancer population and by the application of those WHO criteria, 50, I'm sorry, 42% were receiving inadequate analgesia. Bill Breitbart over at Sloan Kettering looked at the same issue in AIDS patients where he's got an AIDS pain clinic, and here fully 84% of patients were receiving inadequate analgesia. And there's many reasons for this that we'll discuss, such as the barriers. Why do patients not get adequate analgesia? And this is particularly relevant to HIV, but to all the neuropathic pain syndromes. Patients may be reluctant 
to report their pain. They may not want to distract us from issues they consider more important. They may not want to be seen as drug seekers or substance abusers. And of course, in HIV, many people already have this history, even if they're clean and sober. The healthcare providers feed into this. How many times do we hear perhaps a resident say, if I give this patient a Percocet, they're going to become an addict or they're going to scam me and sell it on the street? Very common and not to be ignored. These are important issues, but one has to put them in perspective. And the healthcare system with triplicates, narcotic restrictions, controlled labels, all of those can put barriers up. And of course, OxyContin is one of the poster children of these issues where there has been a lot of diversion, a lot of abuse, particularly in the Southeast. And they talk about deaths that are common. There's just been an article in the Times with the increasing difficulty getting OxyContin. There's now the duragesic patch is being heavily abused. And here docs are being given prison sentences for abuse of opioid prescribing. Some legitimately deserving jail, some maybe being prosecuted a bit too aggressively. Anatomy of pain. Well, the anatomy is important because it does give us some direction, potentially, toward treatment. From the periphery to the peripheral nerve, dorsal root ganglion, coming up the cord, ultimately into central projections. And each of these points may have specific interventions that are possible. So if we look at this in a different way, we have the nerve terminal here, the periphery, the cord, and the brain, peripheral and central nervous systems. And we can then begin to fill in with various agents, those with potential efficacy at those anatomic levels. The vataloid receptor, such as capsaicin, tricyclics, anticonvulsants, opioids, which in fact work at multiple levels and you can see others. The pain treatment continuum, well, it's not true that the more invasive a treatment is, the more effective it is. In fact, we have some of the least data for the most invasive approaches, such as surgery or intrathecal treatment. But we go from psycho and physical approaches to topicals to orals, injections, into surgery and we can mix and match these in a given patient. What are the cardinal variables or parameters that we look at to determine if a treatment should be used? Efficacy, safety, ease of use, and cost. And for efficacy, the gold standard, of course, is the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. Unfortunately, we don't have that quality of data for many of the diseases we treat and for many of the agents we have. Thus, one needs to sometimes rely on clinical case series or extrapolation from one disease to another, which is problematic because one can't always extrapolate. What works in one disease may not for another. And from the FDA's perspective, at least up until now, they haven't been terribly interested in extrapolation and often and up till now have been approving drugs on a disease-by-disease disease basis rather than broad neuropathic pain, as opposed to Europe, which has taken a somewhat different approach. Well, as a clinical trialist, one can put out a number of adages. Firstly, the plural of anecdote is not data, right? How many times do we hear a senior professor coming and saying, I've seen a hundred of these patients. They all get better with treatment X. This is what we're going to use. Well, that's important to have clinical experience. We respect it, but it is biased. What's the alternative? Well, the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial is the worst form of evidence, which sounds heretical from someone who spends much of his career doing these studies, except for every other form of evidence. And that's adapted from Winston Churchill's comments on democracy, in which he said democracy is the worst form of government except for every other form of government. And we can look at the Middle East right now and get dramatic examples of that. 
And the fact is, this is what we have to live with if we believe in evidence-based medicine, which not everybody does, by the way. Well, there are challenges in trials. So for example, how do we define the disease? What are the inclusion-exclusion criteria? What outcome measures are relevant? And what about the unpredictable large placebo effect is very problematic. We have non-pharmacologic options. And you can just read through these from relaxation, PTOT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and others. And many patients avail themselves of these. Many of them report that they work for them, and they probably do. Problem is, most of them don't have terribly good data for support. There is increasing data, much negative, some positive. Pharmacologic. Now, I'm going to fly through this very quickly for sake of time because we only have about 15 minutes and I want to leave time for questions. But here are the classes of pharmacology that I'll briefly mention. Topicals, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, and opioids. Now, if we look to the current state of affairs at the FDA, these are the only FDA-approved agents for neuropathic pain. Lidocaine patch for PHN, gabapentin, only PHN, even though it's been used so widely for others, carbamazepine, duloxetine, which has painful diabetic neuropathy, pregabalin, PHN and diabetic neuropathy, and the high concentration capsaicin patch, or Cutenza, which I know some of you are familiar with here and doing here, is FDA approved in the US for only PHN, although HIV is about to be submitted to the FDA. And in Europe, for all peripheral neuropathic pain other than diabetes, because there's not enough data. I'm going to skip over mechanisms for the moment for sake of time and move right into data. Gabapentin, here's data on diabetic neuropathy from Misha Bakanya, and you can see a significant benefit there. And it's been used widely in diabetes, even though it's not FDA approved. Pregabalin is approved for diabetic neuropathy. And here you see data on clear separation between pregabalin and placebo. And that was replicated in several studies. Now here's a good example of the difficulty in extrapolating from one disease to another. I showed you positive data on pregabalin and diabetes. Here we have HIV. And we conducted a multi-centered study of titrating pregabalin from 150 to 600 milligrams per day, flexible dosing, in about 300 patients. And again, sorry for the projection, but here in yellow we have the placebo response. Here in blue, the pregabalin response. And we had a couple of significant separation points, but the primary results of the study were negative. This did not significantly separate globally. And thus, this was a negative trial. Now, why was it negative? Well, there's many possible reasons, and we've speculated about them. But one of them is that although patients were permitted to titrate up to 600 milligrams a day, the mean dose was only 386 milligrams. Was that sufficient? Well, we could probably talk about that for a while on your own experiences, but at least most patients did not titrate up to the maximum dose the study allowed, mostly for limitations due to adverse effects. So now we move to the global discussion of the study. And we'll put the HIV study in perspective relative to some of the other studies with pregabalin. Here we have placebo in gray, pregabalin 150, 300, and 600. And here we have the data in five pooled PHN studies and seven pooled diabetes studies. And one can see, and these are all post hoc, these were not primary pre-specified analyses, but we can see clearly that there was a separation in these data points. Notice that in the HIV study, there was not. And we have the placebo arm here, the 
mean dose of 386 here, the primary endpoint. And the reason that this didn't separate was we had a huge placebo response. Compare the placebo here to those of the other studies. And that large placebo effect washed out what was a similar active drug effect in the study. Now, based on this, we are in the process of conducting another study. And that other study is basically has a tweaked methodology. And we, I'm not going to go into the details of how we tweaked it, but we addressed a number of limitations in methodology in the first. And this study is now accruing, replicating, or at least repeating this, this study. And it's worldwide looking to get 450 patients, including South Africa, where there's a large burden of disease, Eastern Europe, South America, and the States. Now, opioids, you know all this mechanism of action. I'm going to skip over this for sake of time. And you all know that opioids have been demonstrated effective, including studies by Russ and some of you, in neuropathic pain states. In this case, post-herpetic neuralgia with controlled release oxycodone. Well, this is one of the centers of discussions of breakthrough pain. And again, Russ has gotten very involved in this issue of pain that breaks through the baseline. And baseline is defined by the pain managed by around-the-clock medication. What does one do about these breakthroughs? Well, certainly in cancer, there are numerous studies showing that these are effectively treated by several agents, including the ultra-rapid-acting fentanyl preparations. But what about non-cancer pain? Well, I've already defined this. Now, Russ has published a number of studies that have shown that cancer-related breakthrough pain and non-cancer pain is really quite similar in their characteristics. And by my opinion, and I think Russ shares this, is that it's a somewhat arbitrary distinction to separate cancer from non-cancer, particularly these days when cancer patients are treated, cured, living long lives. They're not all terminal end-stage patients by any means. And so we did a study and published one a number of years ago on the fentanyl buckle tablet in breakthrough pain in opioid-tolerant patients with chronic neuropathic pain. And here were the results, and this type of result, in a sense, mirrors what we see in some of the cancer studies. At the onset of the breakthrough pain episode, the patient took, in this case, Ventura. And this was the placebo improvement. This was Ventura. And you can see that by 10 minutes, we see a separation. Now, that's obviously far quicker than one would expect in oral opioids, which can take 30 to 45 minutes. Cannabinoids, there is a large literature on efficacy of cannabinoids. I'm not going to go through it specifically, but suffice it to say that cannabinoids can be effective, in this case, in HIV pain. Now, Ricardo, we go until what time? What do we need to stop? We have, we have two more. Oh, yes? Okay, because I don't want to overstay my welcome. Uh, well, um, to go. This is just too okay, okay. Um, so in terms of cannabinoids, here are data at the UC San Francisco site where patients compare, were taken into the clinical research unit. They were given placebo marijuana cigarettes with THC extracted government grade. This is grown by the government. And compared to active cannabis marijuana cigarettes, and these were the pain differences that significantly favored cannabis. Obviously, there are side effects, psychological particularly. One can argue whether they're the pros outweigh the cons. Obviously, there's the whole legal debate, the legalization by certain states, but the feds have not legalized it. So you've got a fed versus state issue that in California is particularly problematic. Tricyclics basically work on everything. I'm not going to go through that as well. But clearly, 
tricyclics are effective in neuropathic pain. In fact, some of the classical literature here going back to Mitch Max in 87 shows that whether or not people are depressed, they respond to tricyclics. And so when patients are getting these agents, they often say, well, I'm not depressed, doc. You think this is all in my head, this pain? And of course, one should tell them that there is an independent action on pain, and that's why we're using it. Now, if they happen to be depressed also, which many are, well, you get more bang for the buck treating two diseases with one agent. Obviously, tricyclics have a lot of baggage, and they come with many side effects, some of which you see here. And particularly in the elderly, these can be very problematic to the point that the Geriatric Association has essentially said they should not be used in an elderly population. Increased falls and so forth. And so one has to start relatively low dose. And I generally don't go above about 100 milligrams a day. Some go to 150 for neuropathic pain. Now, the more novel classes of antidepressants, the so-called SNRIs, work on serotonin and norepinephrine, venfla venlafaxine, duloxetine, and milnasopram, a third agent now available. Again, the analgesic effect is independent of the antidepressant effect. Here is one of the diabetic studies with duloxetine. We have placebo, 20 milligrams, 60, and 120. And 60 and 120 separated from 20 and placebo, although did not separate from each other. And people argue as to whether it's worth going from 60 to 120. Some do, some don't. Now finally, let me just briefly talk about topicals. And I'm particularly fond of topicals because you don't have to give more pills. And most patients, certainly in HIV, where they're already taking a ton of pills, are delighted not to take more pills. And also, they don't have systemic adverse effects, at least the transdermals, not the ones that are absorbed systemically, like fentanyl. Now again, not great projection, but we have topicals that work over the area of skin where we apply it, in this case, the lidocaine patch. We have transdermals, in this case, the fentanyl patch, which is systemic. And so we can't confuse a local effect from a systemic effect, obviously. Now, lidocaine has been studied, particularly in posterpedic neuralgia, which is where it has been demonstrated to be effective in several studies, and in which it's FDA approved. Clearly, this drug, lidocaine patch, is used off-label in a large number of conditions without the data, but it's easy to use. Some people feel it helps. It's got a great placebo effect. It also limits contact sensitivity, so there are reasons why people like to use it. Now, the final agent, capsaicin. This is one that's been a pet project of mine now for over a decade. And capsaicin is the active ingredient in the hot chili pepper. It's got a known receptor the so-called VR1 or vanilloid receptor, response to heat, pain, acid. These are available on the market in very low concentration, 0.025 to 0.075 percent. But there is also a high concentration patch now commercially available that I'll show you some data on. Well, how do we apply capsaicin? This is one way, in effect, this is a folk remedy that's been used in cultures for thousands of years from not quite this much application, but in fact, a patient of mine, a Chinese-American physician, told me his grandma used to steep jalapeno peppers in alcohol in the basement, and when the kids had injuries, she would rub it on, it would burn, and then the pain would go away. How does one apply it? Well, in distal polyneuropathy, which is an off-label use, one maps out the area of the most severe pain, in this case, the distal foot. And then one carefully applies the capsaicin patch. They're premedicated with lidocaine-type creams, such as Emla, for an hour. Then they get the capsaicin patch applied in the feet for 30 minutes, for in the trunk for PHN for 
60 minutes. Interesting, different time application. One wears nitrile gloves, wants to do it in a well-ventilated room, and then you take it off. It can cause a little bit of increase in blood pressure, which is really its own s only side effect other than pain during the application, and we treat people as needed <coughs> with oral opioids during the procedure if the pain increases. Now, what does the mechanism look like? Well, here we have control on the right. These are these nice epidermal nerve fibers I showed you sh here. After a week after application of Cutenza, the capsaicin patch, we see loss of these epidermal nerve fibers. They are degenerated. They're pruned. They do come back, and they come back to almost full density within about 24 weeks of the application. There's progressive return over those weeks. Now, what are the data look like? Well, there are data in PHN, which were positive in several pivotal studies that led to the approval by the FDA. HIV has positive data as well. And this is the study that I had the privilege of leading a couple of years ago, 300 plus patients, 90, 60, and 30 minute application time, 12 week randomized double blind after the initial single application, and then 40 week open label. And this is, these are what the data look like. Here is the control. Now, what did we use for control? Well, you couldn't use a true placebo in t inactive patch. Why? Because everybody would be unblinded, because everybody feels the burning of the patch application. If they didn't have the burning, they would know they weren't getting it, and that would unblind. And so we used a active control that is a low concentration capsaicin patch, in this case 0.04% compared to 8%. So it did have a bit of pharmacologic activity, which may have increased the control response. A true placebo may have been less. We don't know. And here was the active. And you can see a clear separation over the entire 12 weeks. And notice the difference was maintained out to 12 weeks, and in fact went out to 18 weeks before they, these patients requested reapplication. Now, what are the future directions of this drug? Well, it's local, only local effects, which is nice. There was a second phase three study. This had a similar active response, but there was a very large control response effect. And that washed out, like in the pregabalin experience, the positive response. So this had a negative primary outcome, although it was positive on several secondary outcomes. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done in terms of mechanism of action, duration, long-term safety. I mentioned PHNs approved, European for all neuropathy other than DPN, and we may see an HIV approval in the not too distant future in the US. Finally, let me finish with a brief mention of combination agents. And there's been increasing interest in combination therapy brought in early in treatment as opposed to the stepwise approach where you start with a weak, then you go to the, a stronger, then a stronger, then a stronger. That can take actually a couple of years to happen. So Ian Gilron, well, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the advantages, you may decrease adverse effects by using each agent in lower dose and hopefully increased efficacy. Downside, well, obviously you're combining drugs. You may get more adverse effects. You may have drug-drug or metabolic interactions. And if you have multiple drugs on board, sometimes you don't know what's causing the adverse effect. Well, this has been tested and published by Ian Gilron in the New England Journal, where he did a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial and compared placebo, lorazepam to mimic the dry mouth, and sedation long-acting morphine, gabapentin, and the combination of the two. And he looked at a number of outcome measures. And this is what the outcome looked like. This was the pain reduction with placebo, gabapentin alone, morphine alone, and gabapentin and morphine. And the two together, initiated at onset, was more effective and one did not actually buy more adverse effects than the two individually, 
due in part to the fact that the doses in combination could be lower of each agent than they were if they were used individually. Interventional techniques, I am not going to get into in any great detail. Clearly, there's been a lot of interest, particularly in stimulation therapy. The data is still not nearly as robust as one might like, but it is being used around the country and the world in refractory neuropathic pain patients, and I'd be interested to know if any of you have experience with this and what it is. And so finally, this is our neuropathy research group at Mount Sinai, who I'd like to acknowledge, including our collaborators at various NIH consortia. And with that, I will stop, and if there's time, I'll be more than happy to take questions. Thank you.